Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover, and thank you for joining me here in TNO, the last news of Europe, in which we're going to explore the Trans-Euro Confederation. A ragtag assortment of former involuntarily unpaid people, partisans, Euroleague, and NKVD survivors, Zatals mercenaries, and soldiers from Svedlosk. They formed a civilian-led confederation focused around the two cities of Perm and Zatals, representing the western and eastern side of the Euros respectively. They will establish a stronghold, a neutral ground at Mount Yamanatal. Yamantau, while Taborowski once stood and thought himself unassailable, this will be the de jure capital. The trans euro Confederation has a single task and purpose, holding fast against the tide of madness and uh, other dudism, standing for all that the Euro Guard once saw as a good in Russia and protecting the hundreds of thousands of people that they find themselves ruling over. Oh boy. And we are led by a certain Haji Umar Mamsuraf, so if you'd like to read about him, please go right ahead. But it looks like he's a little bit depressed. But the Confederation, once again the foundation of a nation, would have been met with fanfare, excitement, and the hope from its populace within the cities of Permans or Taust. And all the outlying towns and villages, however, there was only silence. It was a melancholy silence. One that had been born of the terror of the Rad, Rad Mad Regent's regime. Where once the people of these lands had held hope within their hearts, now there was nothing but a silent resolve. In the small town of Mezgore, Haji Umar Mamsarov stood before a small crowd of the former Euro Guard, the NKVD, and the Third Army soldiers, along with many natives of the region around Mount Yamantau. He was here to be sworn in as the first president of the newly formed Trans Euro Confederation to his left. His adjutant, adjutant gave him a thumbs up. Within the lands under the tentative control of the Confederation, the masses huddled around old radios to hear their leader's speech. The old soldier steadied himself before beginning his speech. I've never been one for speeches, so I'll try to keep this brief. He began, it began only, it has only been a few scant months since the unification of Russia under the boot of the Mad Regent. Yet in that time his dogs had brought untold ruin to the peoples of Russia. Thousands slaughtered in, his, in this mad quest for a dead child. Now he is dead and the long road to recovery has begun. I stand here today not simply as your leader, no. I stand here mere, merely a man, chosen to lead you through the night and into a better dawn. He stopped there and waited, or weighed his next words carefully. When he spoke Next, he swore an oath before God and the people of the Confederation that unknowingly mirrored one made by the founder of the Euroleague years before him. He pledged an oath of servitude to the people and spoke with passion in his heart that he would fight to his dying breath to protect them. This oath would be sworn by every one of his successors until the day finally came for the Confederation to end, for better or for worse, to serve Russia. And we have the National Spirit's Salted Earth. Mm, nice and salted. And Memories of Heroism, which is pretty good. Plus 15% attack and defense and division recovery rate. That is pretty darn nice, if I do say so myself. In his wake, few noticed. When the small group departed the Confederation's borders, there was, after all, no shortage of refugees amidst the chaos of the region's fall. But these men were not mere refugees. They had a purpose, a goal. One driven by faith and gratitude for and towards one whom they all considered the greatest man any ever met. And that man was Janis Mendrix. To him, all of them. Whether Balt or Polo or any other had been first and foremost a victim of the Soviet state's infamous gulags. They all remembered well the hardship, the senseless violence, the deprivation, and above all the hopelessness felt when shackled within them. In the fall of the state to the Germans, however, they had gained their freedom. Something they, at this point, and little better than animals themselves, had little use for. They all knew how close they had been to the edge. Until Mendrix had shown them a better way. Shown them that they could cooperate and fight to protect God's children. And in doing so, save themselves from darkness. Through their years fighting the Euro League, they had all seen ample evidence of that darkness indeed, even so. None of them had been prepared for the horror that was Tabaretsky's Russia, but using the principles Mendrix had imparted to, on them, they all had survived and, by helping and fighting for each other. But they had needed a mission, a purpose, and they had found it. They intended to travel to Rome. It would be a long and difficult journey, though inhospitable terrain, and dangerously unstable statelets across the ideological spectrum. But they would do it or die trying, for... They all knew, in their heart of hearts, that Mendrix was truly a saint. It only needed to be made official. They would ensure it was. There was no man more deserving. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Very nice. And let's take a look here. Uh, let's see. What is improving here? This academic base is getting worse. Research facilities is stagnant. Stagnant. Poverty rate is getting slightly worse. But industrial expertise, as well as the army professionalism, is slowly improving. Justice be done. Colonel Roman Ulanovich Bolsonov had seen better days. He had been tasked by his higher-ups in the Euro pur purification zone to lead a raid on the degenerates and the Jews that had taken over Perman's Hotels, and at first, the operation was a success. The village they descended on had no idea what had hit them. However, they were surrounded and picked off by the dude Euro Guardsmen, and some remnant of Batov's lot. Now he sat, be beaten and bruised by his captors, as some mongrel who... 
Ho read off a list of his so-called crimes. Haji Umar Mansurab presided over the first of many trials that would be that would set an important precedent for the future of the Confederation. When the dude Colonel Bolsonov had been dragged before him, he had had been ever so tempted to simply have the man executed out of hand. He had been personally responsible for the deaths of thousands of Russian citizens since he joined the Shtumoviki and the Mamsarov would have liked nothing more than to put a bullet into him himself. But that wasn't the right course of action. And so he authorized military trials for Bolsonov and those of his men that survived the fighting outside Perm. Of course, for all that this was a legitimate, legitimate trial, the verdict was never in question. Roman Ulyanovich, Bolsonov, you have been brought before this tri tribunal to answer for your crimes against the people of Russia. You stand accused of treason, murder, extortion, extortion, and the use of poison gas on civilian populations. How do you plead? I admit to no crime. This trial is a farce, controlled by the Jews and mongrels. You will all burn in heck for your actions, the man raved. His defense lasted three long hours of long-winded spew before a verdict was called. This court finds the accused guilty on all charges. Justice for the vanquished. Wow, we really don't have a lot of political power here, do we? Minus 105? Wow. That's pretty darn bad. <clears throat> For a higher cause, though. Bring him to me, said Mamstrov. The aide that led him through the station halls, past the gawking officers and recruits, into the quiet room used normally for interrogations. Today it served a different purpose, a welcoming room for esteemed guests. The door closed behind Mamstrov, and he regarded the weathered figure who once owned this land like it was his ma mansion. Mikhail Kalashnikov, Mamstrov began, and the man warily raised his head in the acknowledgement. Kalashnikov was not as Mam Mamstrov had seen in so many reels of footage, so many pictures of parades and factories. To say he'd lost weight was an understatement. His cheekbones had jutted from his face, highlighting his sunken eyes and his winter jacket loosely hung from his hunched form. A scar dragged itself across his cheek, trailing off at his jawline, making Mamstrov wince on instinct. I wish we could have met under better circumstances. I do too, comrade. Kalashnikov's voice was low and quiet, and a silence hung in the air as both men considered their next words. I suppose this is not just a friendly meeting? I'm afraid not, Mamstrov pulled an envelope from his pocket. Our engineers could use a training, could use training. From a designer with your level of skill, Lord knows we need the weaponry. With the madmen we call our neighbors, payment will be. Payment? Kalashnikov looked up with the most force Mamstrov had seen out of the man so far. You think I still care about payment? Look at me. Look at my. <clears throat> he raised his right hand, showing the stumps of what were once fingers. I'm old. I'm dying. I couldn't give less of a crap about payment. The least I can do is teach those who come after me. <clears throat> How to build a rifle. He paused, taking a deep breath, rattling breath. And god darn it, they're going to have to have the best rifle man's ever made if I have anything to do with it. Even the merchant pulls his greed aside in these times. And of course, we have 100% authoritarian democracy, which is pretty power consolidated. A lot of power consolidation here. <clears throat> and a cup of coffee to keep us nice and warm. My friends, here's to you. The last 20 years of Yasha Korolov's Life has been nothing more than an excruciating, humbling experience for what was once a simple, no-life bandit, consigned to back-breaking work in a gulag. Mendrix and the other soldiers took him in, a no-life thief, and shaped him into a man with something to live for, something to protect. The Yasha of old wouldn't ever sacrifice anything for anyone, but Yasha remembers vividly, and proudly the memories of hastily assembling sandbags on an abandoned house, the faint memories of Delvango's pillages, cars roaring in the distance. Success was hard on and almost made up of the loss of part of his ear to a stray shot that day. Then the darnable regent, hidden his twisted corpse of an empire, came. They've tried their best. They really, really did. Yasha pushes his wheelchair, one of the wheels slightly rusty and harder to push than the other, and one of the tires clearly empty, and yet, no yet was nothing short of a commodity around these parts. Half of his face was permanently paralyzed, making it fairly awkward to breathe with only one active nostril. His legs are gone, replaced by wooden pegs and burns across his body. Yasha looks much older than 40-odd year veteran that has any right to be. And yet, he's alive, and as he lowers a wreath upon with his good arm, surrounded by veterans like him, <clears throat> covered in their war tales, he can't help but cry as the memories flood the young yet aged soul. The statue is a recent thing built from the remaining rubble, the fruit of a surviving sculptor, flood from the harrowing shadow that befell the re 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 what? Oh, my apologies. <clears throat> Surviving sculptor fled from the harrowing shadow that befell what remained of his home in Svedlosk, to pick a man he never met, but heard tales from other veterans, and came to admire as much as did Mendrix himself. Pavel Batov, creating a dying Euro-god soldier, a scene he came to see so many times. With immense effort, 
<clears throat> he did one shaky salute to the patriot he never met, but felt he knew for ages. Your agony is our triumph. But if you enjoyed today's episode, as we look at the Trans Euro Confederation, please leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow in another video. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.